Welcome to the uh, Scripture and Ministry series sponsored by the Henry Center here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I'm uh, Pastor Lee Eklove. I'm the pastor of the Village Church of Lincolnshire. It's my privilege today to be interviewing an old friend of mine, Dr. Craig Blomberg, who is the Distinguished uh, Professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary, author of some 15 books. And uh, we're going to be talking particularly today, Craig, about one of them, the um, Neither Poverty Nor Riches, which is in this um, uh, new, te- new Studies in Biblical Theology series that Dr. Carson has edited. Uh, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be together with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about where, just where does this title come from, Neither Poverty Nor Riches? It comes out of the Bible, but from a little-known passage in Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, verses 8 and 9, where the writer has already asked of God uh, two things. Do not refuse me before I die. And then he writes, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. An obscure text in Proverbs that you might think has little chance of having timeless application, and yet many commentators on the Sermon on the Mount will suggest that behind Jesus' teaching in the Lord's Prayer, that we should pray, give us this day our daily bread, is uh, this passage, give me only my daily bread. So this book that you've written, uh, the drift of it is what? I mean, the, the, the overview, if somebody's not familiar with this series and how this works, what was that about? It is uh, a rapid survey of all the most relevant passages in the Bible, literally from Genesis to Revelation, on the topic of money, material possessions, uh, what they should mean, what they do mean in uh, God's uh, plan of working with people throughout history. So this would be useful not only for somebody just wanting to acquaint themselves with the subject, but also say a stewardship sermons series. This could function something like a commentary that's focused on special passages. Very much so, and if someone doesn't want to wade even through a couple of hundred pages, I've created a a small uh, booklet of sorts called Heart, Soul, and Money with College Press that can be used for personal or group Bible study and uh, gets at the uh, Reader's Digest version. Great. Well, I come to this uh, conversation with you as a pastor, and I uh, have just been thinking about a a variety of different questions that occur to me and that we're we're going to talk about, I hope, to the benefit of others. Let's just start with talking about uh, the old Puritan work ethic or the Protestant work ethic. Uh, if if by the dint of honest hard work, uh, someone amasses a you know considerable amount of resources and money, uh, are they free to now use this the way they wish? They they got it the old-fashioned way. They earned it. Uh, are they free to use this money as they wish? Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6 that uh, God gives us uh, material possessions as good gifts for our enjoyment. So certainly there's a a dimension of that uh, in Scripture. And the Proverbs and the Psalms regularly talk about those who work hard and use such metaphors as uh, the industriousness of the ant. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's no question that the Bible recognizes a, a theme of uh, a certain level of material prosperity as a reward for hard work. It also recognizes that there are plenty of times when we work as hard as we can and, and things don't work out that way. But I think what we have to remember is that even the most morally, industriously gained income in the world is still, from a Christian perspective, seen as a gift from the Lord. and. We are to be stewards of that and to be generous givers and responsible in in everything that we do, uh, however the money is acquired. One of the hardest things for us to kind of grapple with, and especially here on the North Shore of Chicago, but in America generally, is our prosperity 
in the face of poverty, yeah. poverty here in our city or in the world. And we all know this dilemma of trying to decide if we wanted to help someone who's poor, how difficult it is to know sort of who's the worthy poor. And uh, should I be concerned about a fellow who comes to the church wanting a handout about his responsibility? Uh, Is that an issue in dealing with the poor as a Christian? I think it is. Um, many churches that uh, are active in, in reaching out to the particularly needy of their community may have something like a, uh, a food bank or a clothes closet, or uh, they will, uh, uh, up to a certain limit, uh, write uh, checks to help people pay for uh, rent or for utilities, um, but they will never just hand people cash. And because of uh, the kind of world that we live in, there is uh, always a potential for scam and for abuse. Uh, so we do have to, to give intelligently. We do have to give thoughtfully. Uh, on the other hand, I think we can become so consumed with the question, might somebody misuse uh, what we give them, that, that we become paralyzed into inaction. And we probably need to remember that God reached out to us, uh, we who were still enemies, as Paul puts it in Romans 5, to reconcile us. There, there isn't one of us who was worthy prior to God reaching out to us. And therefore, uh, there's another sense in which uh, if we're looking for a truly worthy poor person to give to, we'll never find one because none of us is worthy. If uh, practically everyone who seeks to be generous to the poor has had the experience of realizing after the fact, I just got scammed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've certainly had that experience. And I've felt, even in using some of the church's money on occasion where I've been scammed, how should we feel about that? Uh, like, well, the Lord knows, or I was not a good steward, or what would our reaction be? if we've faced that, because most everyone has who's uh, tried to be generous. I think uh, in line with the the last Mm -hmm. question that it forces us back to consider how can we be wiser. Um, Jesus says to be as shrewd as serpents but as innocent as doves. Uh, There is no call to... uh, give so thoughtlessly that we will regularly be so victimized, but um, learn from the mistake, figure out as best as possible how to avoid it in the future, Um, work together. Uh, In the Denver area, we have, uh, I'm told, what is the the largest uh, concentration of evangelical Christian parachurch ministries in our city for any metropolitan area of comparable size in the country and most of them work with each other and many of them were birthed out of just one or two churches and the people know each other so um, there would be some folks I would know not all of them who would say I never give a handout to a homeless person on the streets Uh, but I ask them, do you need a meal? And if they say yes, um, take them to a nearby McDonald's that regularly reaches out to the homeless and find out if that's what they really need, then they can get it there. Do you need a place to stay? I'll tell you how to find the rescue mission. Um, So it doesn't mean that we don't help, but it does mean that we help wisely so that hopefully we avoid being scammed. Let's switch gears. Um, In Acts, we have these two or three passages that refer to communalism, you might say, the the pooling of resources in the early church. What's a pastor to do in preaching that? Uh, I grew up in the upper Midwest where we have Hutterite colonies, which are all Mm. communal. They literally live this way. But that's not something we generally buy into. What is the principle that we should get from Acts uh, 4 or or 2 or whatever? 
Well, it's interesting because uh, if you keep going through the book of Acts, you'll find that there are diverse models right within the first generation of Christian history. And so by the time you get to chapter 6, you don't have any reference to a, a common treasury anymore, but you have reference to the selecting of what seems to have been the precedent for the first deacons in order that they might personally minister in uh, daily provisions of food or money to the needy in the tightly knit communities where they could have some oversight and supervision of, of how those goods were being used. Then in chapter 11, you have the prophet Agabus predicting a famine and uh, Paul and company determining to take up a collection. And in fact, that collection is not a one-time effort because in First and Second Corinthians and Romans, there are several years later repeated references to uh, this ongoing commitment on Paul's part to secure money from churches and people with surplus to give to those who are less needy. So I think the answer is that there are a whole variety of mechanisms used throughout Scripture and even right in the book of Acts for helping the poor. Uh, there are parts of the world that uh, have a strong communal tradition in their culture and something like an Acts 2 or an Acts 4 model can work better there. Um, but if that's not a good fit for our culture, then let's find mechanisms that work. But the transcending principle is let's be concerned for the poor. Another text would be uh, that every preacher knows for stewardship sermons is Second Corinthians uh, 8 and 9 about uh, the offering uh, for the church back in Jerusalem. Hermeneutically, how do we know what the proper application of this text is? Is this encouraging us to su support the poor, poor believers, to do what our church leaders deem is an important ministry, whether it's the poor or something else? What, what are the frameworks of how we could properly use uh, this kind of a text, which is so so wonderful, but I know you know. Can you use it for a building program? <laughs> can you use it if the budget's behind for missions giving? It's interesting that uh, the most obvious uh, theme of Second Corinthians eight and nine uh, is a collection for the more impoverished believers in Judea after a. Uh, an empire-wide famine, but one that hit Israel particularly hard. But there also is this sense of it being a kind of tribute, uh, a kind of response of gratitude to the, we might say, mother church in Jerusalem right. uh, in keeping things going for uh, the congregation that ultimately was the one through whom all others in uh, the empire were birthed. If you look at uh, the entire teaching of Scripture, the two recurring themes across many different contexts for, for giving are that the work of those who are in what we call full-time ministry and the work of God's people gathered in community for worship and everything that goes along with that uh, can continue and can continue in a good, uh, God-pleasing way. And then secondly, that uh, those who are either spiritually uh, lost and hence very needy or physically poor and struggling are helped through the use of one's money. Um, Throughout church history, the vast majority of Christian giving, in principle at least, has met one or the other of, of those two broad needs. Uh, the work of the church and her full-time ministers uh, internally and reaching out to the spiritually and physically needy at home and abroad. Uh, if a given building program proposal uh, can justifiably be seen as enhancing one or both of those parts of uh, Christian responsibility, then I think the principles here certainly could relate. I am concerned, though, that particularly in North America, there is often the 
the default assumption that if we have outgrown our current facility, gone to two, three, four, five services, um, then the only option, the one right thing to do is to build. That may be the case, but have we thought about church plants? Have we thought about decentralizing? Have we thought about home groups? Have we thought about meetings off-site? Those may or may not be uh, good um, kingdom-enhancing options, but have we at least thought through the options before we come to our decision? Again, let's switch gears. Um, We often hear I don't know if this is true, that there are more verses about giving than anything else, or about money than anything else, any other subject. In the, is that true, do you think? I've never counted. <laughs> I, I know that uh, about 20% of the verses that in some Bibles appear in red letters, i.e. the teachings of Jesus and the Gospels, are on money matters. Um, but that also means there's 80% left on everything else, and I've never analyzed to see how they'd break down. <laughs> <laughs> There, uh, we have all this material that pastors can choose from if they want to preach on yeah. this subject. Do you have favorites, or are there angles that you think we ought to think about that probably don't occur to us? I mean, Second Corinthians 8 and 9 is pretty obvious. Right. But are there other things that you might recommend? I'm always intrigued by the uh, trio of passages in Luke 18 and 19. It's only Luke that groups those three together. The best known is the rich young ruler, which comes with all of its interesting problems. But I like to speak about Zacchaeus in Luke 19, um, who is not called by Christ to give up anything, but voluntarily renounces half of what undoubtedly was a large sum of wealth, since he's the one tax collector in Scripture called a chief tax collector Uh and probably enormously wealthy and he also promises to restore fourfold those whom he has defrauded Um, I like to go to the book of James for all kinds of reasons Uh, it tends to be neglected in in many uh, preaching ministries and uh, it has a lot of fairly pointed things to say about rich and poor Um, I like to go to the end of the book of Revelation Uh, I am just so encouraged by Revelation 21 and 22. Um, It's great for Easter to remind us that uh, our hope is about resurrection life and not just about disembodied immortality and that our eternal hope is resurrection life in a new heavens and a new earth, not in just some airy-fairy celestial uh, remote region, but... The other thing that's fascinating about those last two chapters of the Bible is how earthy they are. And uh, this truly is a garden of earthly delights that uh, we have to look forward to. Um, To use the language of of modern advertising, the Bible ends promising Christians that we can have it all. Uh, Yet there are strings attached. It's not that we'll just go out and have all the things we wish we could buy from today's shopping malls or Ebays, it has to be in the context of now we commit ourselves to Jesus and probably to some surrendering of our desires to be as well off as we might be um, for the sake of the kingdom, knowing that there is a marvelous eternity awaiting us. Uh, We have to practice what in an older, uh, less politically correct era was once called uh, the delayed gratification of the middle class, Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't seem to exist much anymore. (laughs) Brings up an interesting (laughs) point. Uh, One of the realities of uh, the people in our church is there are some who flat out love to shop. (laughs) And whether it's, you know, going to the mall or it's eBay, they really, this is their hobby. This is what they love yeah. to do. It's a little, it's a little dicey. I mean, no. what what should a pastor <laughs> say to that that situation? Why are you doing it? <laughs> do you largely window shop, or do you largely spend enormous amounts of money? 
Um, my wife likes to joke that uh, on occasion, when various circumstances have been uh, depressing her and some aspect of life, that uh, um, a modest purchase of something she's wanted for a while but put off getting can actually be uh, an encouragement <laughs> to her. And so her comment is, it's still cheaper than therapy. <laughs> um, and, and I usually don't try to refute that. Yeah, that would be wise. Um, yeah. But clearly, shopping could turn into an addiction just like those things we more naturally think of as addictions. So the question is, are you doing this um, to try to create a substitute for some other uh, deeper unmet satisfaction and do you realize that in the long run it really isn't going to address the problem and therefore will simply perpetuate itself? What What's the real issue that we do need to be getting at? We're starting to run out of time, but I wanted to go one other direction. It's an election year. Uh, as Christians, when we hear politicians talk about economics and the poor, does the Bible help us evaluate whether or not we ought to support, say, politicians who favor government help for the poor, legitimately done, let's assume good intention, mm -hmm. or sort of the free enterprise, the free market system that um, rewards the hard work, that gives freedom of choice to the earner to support and help who he wishes, how should Christians sort out some of these things? I think we have to remember that uh, the entire scriptures was completed um, 17 centuries before either Adam Smith or Karl Marx. And therefore, if we are expecting the Bible to directly support either modern capitalism or socialism or any mutations of those within the American democratic system, we're not going to find it. We are going to find a, a strong concern for the poor, which should make us carefully evaluate all such proposals in the modern world with respect to what actually gets the job done the best. Um, before some of us who are more conservative naturally reject uh, all socialist emphases at all, we need to remind ourselves that uh, some form of welfare system has kept uh, alive and has helped uh, heal people of sickness and has helped put food on the table for millions of folks uh, with an amount of money that uh, the church has never demonstrated even remotely uh, having uh, the willingness to share with needy people in that way. Uh, does that mean that the current system or any current system uh, is the maximal option? No, not necessarily at all. And we can have a good, healthy political conversation by Christians equally committed to God's word who disagree on what is best helping people, what would best help people, um, and then we have to vote according to our conscience. Uh, but if, if we at least share that concern and that, that passion that most people get helped in a holistic way that addresses spiritual and physical needs, then uh, even when we disagree politically, we ought to be able to do so as brothers and sisters in Christ in love. One more question. Tithing. Uh, as I've struggled with that as a pastor, it seems to me that a lot rubs or comes down to is this, uh, which kind of law is this in the Old Testament? A moral law must be kept regardless of Old or New Testament. Mm -hmm. Other categories change. What do you think? And when Malachi says, will a man rob God, what does that mean today? Well, and, and it's in the context of bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse and that was very much part of the Jewish civil and ceremonial law. And if you uh, want to make the argument that the Old Testament tithe is enforced today, you have to then be honest and say the Old Testament tithe 
was the triple tithe of 10% to the temple, the priests, and the Levites, 10% for the annual festivals, and three and a third percent for the poor. So if, if you want to support uh, the full tithe as part of the moral law, then let's be clear, we're talking about 23 and a third percent annually. Um, it seems pretty clear to me that in the context of this going for the temple, for the sacrificial system, for the festivals, uh, that, that all of these things are no longer practiced literally. We believe that they are fulfilled in Christ, uh, who is our once-for-all sacrifice, who is our Passover, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what you find from Acts to the end of the Bible uh, in terms of teaching for Christians after the, the coming of the New Covenant with uh, the death and resurrection of Christ is never put in terms of a percentage, but it's put in terms of generosity and sacrifice. Um, for uh, someone in our culture today making 200000 a year, quite frankly, 20000 is rarely a sacrifice. Uh, they are probably being commanded to, to give more. Uh, for somebody making 10000 a year, um, to require them to give 1000 may be irresponsible mm-hmm. because they may have key debts that need to be addressed first. Well, Craig, we could talk longer, but our time is up. I want to thank you on behalf of the Henry Center and the Trinity community. It's been great to have you here with us, and I appreciate uh, your help with these questions. It's my privilege. And again, I would commend uh, your book because it really does help us think about the whole range of subjects on this uh, issue of stewardship and money and poverty and so forth. So thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Without a hitch. All right.